Go ahead and take up your Bibles uh, with me, and uh, we will turn to Acts chapter 23, starting in verse 12. Uh, if you don't have your Bibles uh, with you, I I'd encourage you to use one of the black Bibles that we've provided to you in front of you. And if you need help finding the passage, it can be found on page 877. Um, that way we can follow along, read together, and uh, study it together as we go. Uh, just one final reminder to you that it is a communion Sunday. Uh, we're going to participate uh, together in that as a church family immediately following the sermon. And so if you have not grabbed one of those communion cups um, there's uh, out in the hallway before the service, uh, there's not too much time left before you can uh, get one of those if you intend to participate uh, with us. Uh, if you are visiting with us, please know that it's a regular pattern of ours here to open up God's Word uh, and study it together um, and let God speak to us through His own words. Uh, the primary way that God reveals himself is uh, through his word, his written word, and so we take studying it here uh, very seriously. And so uh, for now, let's go ahead and turn now to God's word together. We're going to read it, and, and then we'll ask him to come and help us understand it. Uh, once again, we're going to start in verse 12 of Acts chapter 23, and I am going to read uh, through to the end of uh, the chapter, verse 35. I invite you to follow along with me as I read. When it was day, the Jews made a plot and bound themselves by an oath neither to eat nor drink till they had killed Paul. There were more than 40 who made this conspiracy. They went to the chief priests and elders and said, We have strictly bound ourselves by an oath to taste no food till we have killed Paul. Now therefore you, along with the council, give notice to the tribune to bring him down to you as though you were going to determine his case more exactly, and we are ready to kill him before he comes near. Now the son of Paul's sister heard of their ambush, so he went and entered the barracks and told Paul. Paul called one of the centurions and said, Take this young man to the tribune, for he has something to tell him. So he took him and brought him to the tribune and said, Paul the prisoner called me and asked me to bring this young man to you and uh, as he has something to say to you. The tribune took him by the hand and going aside asked him privately, what is it that you have to tell me? And he said, the Jews have agreed to ask you to bring Paul down to the council tomorrow as though they were going to inquire somewhat more closely about him. But do not be persuaded by them for more than 40 of their men are lying in ambush for him who have bound themselves by an oath neither to eat nor drink till they have killed him. And now they are ready, waiting for your consent. So the tribune dismissed the young man, charging him, tell no one that you have informed me of these things. And then he called two of the centurions and said, get ready 200 soldiers with 70 horsemen and 200 spearmen to go as far as Caesarea at the third hour of the night. Also provide mounts for Paul to ride and bring him safely to Felix, the governor. And he wrote a letter to this effect. Claudius Lysias, to his excellency, the governor Felix, greetings. This man was seized by the Jews and was about to be killed by them when I came upon them with the soldiers and rescued him, having learned that he was a Roman citizen. And desiring to know the charge for which they were accusing him, I brought him down to their council. I found that he was being accused about questions of their law, but charged with nothing deserving death or imprisonment. And when it was disclosed to me, that there would be a plot against the man, I sent him to you at once, ordering his accusers also to state before you what they have against him. So the soldiers, according to their instructions, took Paul and brought him by night to Antipatris. And on the next day, they returned to the barracks, letting the horsemen go on with them. When they had come to Caesarea and delivered the letter to the governor, they presented Paul also before him. On reading the letter, he asked what province he was from, and when he learned that he was from Cilicia, he said, I will give you a hearing when your accusers arrive. And he commanded him to be guarded in Herod's praetorium. Just pray with me. Father, we confess that these words that we just uh, read, although written by the stroke of human hands, are actually uh, your words. Uh, birthed from your own uh, mouth and your breath, that you inspired them. And is, it is your intention to teach us and show us your glory through the lens of these inspired words. 
And now, Father, we ask this morning, just as it was an act of the Holy Spirit who inspired these words all those years ago, uh, would the Holy Spirit now work once more and illuminate these words to our own minds today. Give us understanding. Give us a fullness of clarity so that we may walk out of this room today knowing you more and thereby loving you more. We thank you for the many ways that you have orchestrated your kingdom purposes and the ways that you have unveiled them to us. So, Father, would you today open our eyes to see your plans? And when your plans are hidden from our face by your own choosing, would you gear our hearts to trust you in your promises? It's in your son Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. In my preparation for this morning, I uh, came across a story from a popular pastor uh, named Chuck Swindoll uh, in regards to an event in his own life um, when he felt utterly uh, powerless. His daughter, uh, Carissa, was a cheerleader when she was in high school and had been practicing with her team. And um, she, uh, on one particular practice, fell from the top of a human pyramid and uh, landed directly on her head. And uh, Swindoll got the call and uh, him and his wife hurried to the school and he explains that when he arrived at her school, she was strapped to a board uh, on a gurney and uh, Carissa had, had told him that she couldn't feel anything. And the next several hours were as if time stood still for him and his wife. As they waited to hear if their daughter was physically paralyzed, uh, they themselves uh, were paralyzed emotionally and paralyzed mentally. In, in those moments, they groaned out to God for help in their circumstance. Uh, eventually, later in the evening, the doctors finally uh, confirmed that she showed no signs of permanent damage uh, and that she was eventually going to be okay. Now, while this turned out well for the Swindoll family, and it could have been much worse, um, he used the story to describe how uncomfortable it is uh, when forced into a situation that we are utterly powerless in when we are in a situation that is completely out of our control. Uh, but, but he explained that when we feel utterly powerless, when we are completely unable to alter uh, the slightest detail of the future, uh, that's when we actually experience life as it is. Uh, th this is an exact quote from Swindoll. He, he says, in truth, we are powerless. We have always been powerless. Our well-being is like a piece of dust in a whirlwind. And to avoid living in constant terror, we construct an elaborate illusion that says we control our destinies until some circumstances bring us back to reality. Swindoll continues on, God has a better way. He wants to replace our delusions of autonomy with the truth of his sovereign care for his people. This is a lesson that the Apostle Paul has had to learn the hard way through the, the book of Acts, and even more so now at this point in the story um, as he sits in custody under investigation from the Romans. If you're just joining us to catch you up to speed in the story, um, Paul was falsely accused by a few Jewish men uh, in the temple. He was accused of actually defiling the temple and speaking out against Judaism and specifically the law of, of Moses, their law. And um, this sparked outrage among a crowd in the temple to the point that they formed a riot, basically a giant mob, hoping to uh, kill Paul in their own uncontrollable anger. And uh, for the last several weeks, we've been, we've been tracking this. Paul was actually put under arrest, more so for his own protection. And um, for the last several weeks, we've seen this tribune try to figure out what's going on with Paul and who he is. And we've, we've been tracking Paul's trial uh, for, for quite some time now. At this point in the story, Paul's fate lies completely in the hands of other people. 
He is absolutely powerless and he is absolutely helpless. He is at the mercy of other people. And as we come into this passage, we see that Paul has a front seat in experiencing, as Swindoll puts it, the the replacement of his delusional autonomy with the truth of God's sovereign care for his people. Uh, Typically, mobs and riots, when they form, they only form when a group of people are angry about something. In our case, the mob that formed in chapter 22 was angry about Paul and angry about his ministry and angry about what what Paul had to communicate about God. Many times, however, as a riot dissipates and is is diffused, the, the issue that they are angry about dissipates along with the crowd. This is not to say that individually that their anger about a particular issue subsides, uh, but the force or the momentum of their action or their cause typically slows down as, as soon as the mob separates. And, and so one could hope in the text that in the days uh, to follow after Paul's incident in the temple, that the anger towards Paul from the Jews in Jerusalem would naturally diminish they would move on and this would be a, a, become a non-issue that perhaps they're still individually angry at Paul, but they're not out for blood as they were. Uh, but in the text this morning, we find unfortunately that this is not the case. We read that as Paul waited in custody, that there were a group of more than 40 Jewish men who plotted to kill Paul. And we read that they are so bent on killing him that they swore an oath not to eat or drink until they had followed through on their plans. And this is designed to show us the intensity of their resolve, that they, that they won't eat or drink. Uh, and even the fact that they took an oath was important. Oath-taking back then was regarded much more serious even, I would say, than it is today. The, to, to take an oath in that context was this sworn commitment to follow through on something with the awareness that should you break the oath, you were considered under a divine curse, that God himself would curse you if you broke your oath to him. And so these men, one of three things are going to happen to these men in this situation. They're either going to succeed in killing Paul, they're gonna end Paul's life, or they're gonna end their own by not eating or drinking, or they break their oath and they live out the rest of their days considered divinely cursed. All this to show that these guys mean business. They're not messing around. That is how much they want to kill Paul. And what's even crazier about this story is that they involve Israeli governing officials in their plan. They go to the chief priests here in verse 14 and the elders for help in accomplishing their conspiracy. And the plan that they present essentially requires this council, the Sanhedrin, which Paul has already stood before and they didn't get any answers. They didn't get anywhere with it. Um, it, it requires this council to go to the tribune who in a way is protecting Paul and they are to ask the tribune to let Paul stand before them again under the pretense that they desire to determine his case more exactly is what verse 15 says. Basically, they're telling the tribune, hey, we know the last time that we gathered, we didn't really accomplish anything. Uh, We know that it turned into just a giant mess and you didn't get any answers. And so let's meet again. Let's bring Paul before us again so that we can determine more exactly what Paul has done wrong. We're gonna get it right this time. And we're gonna make sure um, that you know exactly what is going on with Paul. Now, remember, this would be very appealing for the, for the Tribune because he's still trying to decipher the facts surrounding this case against Paul. He has yet to get a straight answer from anybody about who Paul is and what he has done to make the Jews so angry at him as to kill him. Uh, and so, so according to the plan, the Sanhedrin, the council, is, is offering clarity to the situation for the Tribune if he brings them back in front of him. And then in transport, before Paul would even arrive, he would be ambushed by these 40 assassins and killed. Now, now this plan would appeal to the council because if Paul is killed in transport, uh, it it would accomplish their own desire of of offing Paul, uh, yet they could deny any kind of involvement. 
especially if it goes south. They, they could claim ignorance. Shockingly, we find later uh, in verse 20, in this testimony in verse 20, that the council, the high priest, agrees to this plot, agrees to conspire with these 40 assassins. And with that, as this group of Jewish conspirators, as they unite with the religious authorities in a plot to kill Paul, the story takes a decidedly dark turn. Because up until this point in Jerusalem, any threat to Paul's life was born from an emotional response. It's still severe, it's still dangerous, it's still dark in that they tried to kill Paul, but it was born more so out of their uncontrolled emotion. It was more of a reaction than anything because they were instigated by a few. But here for the first time in Jerusalem, we see a calculated, detailed, thorough assassination plot. They no longer attempt to take Paul's life just because they have no self-control. They, they no longer attempt to kill Paul because their emotions have got the best of them in the heat of the moment in a mob. No, they are logically and consciously thinking this through. This is premeditated murder. And what's most disturbing of all of this is that the high priest and the other elders agree to it. Those are the ones that are supposed to be the gold standard of following the law of Moses. And here they are agreeing to aid and abet in the murder of one who has yet to be proven guilty of his crimes, which was against the law of Moses. What this shows us is how easy it is to compromise our own convictions when we are so determined to get our own way and control a situation. What this shows us is that we crave autonomy so much that we are willing to, to, to give up much. It's interesting that in our clenched grip of control, we often let other things go so easily. In our sinful, self-seeking disposition, we are prone to sacrifice our integrity and our morality or even some of our beliefs if it means getting my own way and maintaining my hold and my control of a situation. And worst of all, rarely do we see our own guilt as we make excuses and try to justify our actions. There is a great danger that lurks in the darkness of our heart when we feel as though we are in a situation that we can't control. We will go to great lengths to regain a position of control, which is what these assassins are doing and what the council members are doing here. They, they didn't get their way with Paul, so they are taking back control by force and sacrificing much to do it. And honestly, it appears that they will succeed in their plot. Right? This is an airtight plot. You read this and say, how, how is this going to fail? This is a sure thing. The tribune is still looking for answers. There's no reason he won't comply with the Sanhedrin's request to bring Paul back to them. This is airtight. But then out of nowhere, in the most unlikely of places, the plot is, is foiled. We don't know how, we don't know where, but, but, but somehow we're told in verse 16 that Paul's young nephew caught wind of this ambush this is the most unexpected thing that you could see in the text. In the way that Paul's nephew is described means that he's most likely a teenager. And he's anywhere from 10 to 17 years old. And this nephew hears about this plot and then he initiates this, right? He takes action despite the risk to himself. The nephew goes to Paul in the barracks and tells Paul about the plot and then Paul calls on one of the centurions to take his nephew to the tribune because his nephew has something important to tell the tribune. Uh, and the tribune um, accepts the testimony. He ends up speaking to the boy in private and, and the boy recounts the entire plot against Paul. 
Uh, now, this is an important step for the tribune. You've got to remember that Paul is a Roman citizen, and the tribune has a great duty to protect him as a Roman citizen. Furthermore, if Paul, is a, uh, as a Roman citizen, was assassinated in Jerusalem by a bunch of Jews, it would have served as a black mark against Rome. And so the tribune goes to great lengths to ensure that this doesn't happen. He, he's saying, this is not going to happen on my watch as long as I'm in charge. This will not happen. And so the, the tribune now knows that the anger against Paul will not subside anytime soon. Uh, th this is not going to become a non-issue. Is, the anger is not going to dissipate. So the longer Paul's in Jerusalem, the more at risk he is in the situation. And so here he intends to send Paul away and, and he sends him with a substantial Roman military uh, entourage. There's as many as 470 soldiers who accompany Paul. They outnumber the assassins 10 to 1. These guys aren't getting anywhere near Paul. These assassins aren't even going to be able to look at Paul from afar. And so they go on their way. Paul is escorted to Caesarea, which is the Roman capital of Judea. And his case is transferred to Felix, who is the, the Roman governor of Judea, that region. And along with Paul, the tribune sends a letter to Felix. Uh, th this was pretty standard. It's to catch him up to speed on the events in Jerusalem. And it's here in this letter that we actually learn the tribune's name for the first time. His name is Claudius Lysias. And uh, Claudius does a fairly good job of accurately recounting the events. However, there is one significant detail that is conveniently, if you will, altered. Um, in verse 27, he, he correctly records that Paul was seized by the Jews and was about to be killed by them when Claudius uh, came upon them with the soldiers and rescued him. That much is true. But then Claudius tells Governor Felix a little white lie, that, that the reason he rescued Paul was because he was a Roman citizen. Now, if you remember the story from chapter 22, you know that that's not the case at all because the tribune didn't know Paul was a Roman citizen until the tribune had Paul bound and nearly flogged, whipped, which incidentally enough is, a, is another glaringly absent detail from the letter. There is no mention here of Paul almost being whipped. And so you see this letter pretty much sums up the story of what we've previously read However, it's told from the perspective and written from the perspective of an unreliable narrator in the Tribune. The, the letter doesn't reveal much new information to us about what we already know to be true, but, but it does reveal to us a little bit of the character of Claudius Lysias, mainly that he is looking out for himself, that, that he is primarily concerned not about Paul, not about Paul's work, not about God, but his own work as a tribune and who he is and how he looks to Governor Felix. Even the way this letter is written, if you were to go back and read it, it, it reads in a way that is extremely self-serving to, to Claudius. You, you'll notice as you read through it that the subject is actually more about Claudius and what he did than what's going on with Paul. He, he writes it in a way to portray himself as the hero He's the one that saved the day. Five times, Claudius refers to himself and his own actions in the letter. I came upon them and rescued him. I brought him down to the, cha to, to the chamber, to, the, to their council. I found that he was falsely accused. And when the plot of, uh, against him was disclosed to me, because I'm an important person, I sent him to you at once. There is quite a selfish character flaw in the tribune, and unfortunately we will notice, as one commentator observes, that as we move up the scale of Roman political power, the character flaws become much more apparent, which we will see the next time we're in Acts with Governor Felix. Upon receiving the letter and upon receiving Paul, uh, Felix asks where Paul is from. Uh, this is mainly to ensure that he has jurisdiction and then Felix agrees to uh, give Paul a hearing when his accusers arrive in the city. And at that point, Felix commands that Paul is to be guarded in Herod's praetorium. 
Uh, Herod's Praetorium, it, it was this magnificent palace in Caesarea that was right off of the coast of the Mediterranean Sea that King Herod had actually built for himself in a prior generation. And it served now as the governor's official residence. So this is where uh, Governor Felix actually lived and it was magnificent. And uh, Paul was to be guarded there, which simply means that, hey, we're going to watch over you, Paul. We're even going to protect you, uh, 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 Paul. Don't, don't think of Paul being under lock and key here. Uh, the, he, he is just under watch. Uh, this experience for him uh, would have been one of relative comfort compared to his own experience in Jerusalem. Uh, th- this is most likely regarded as an upgrade in Paul's circumstance by the end of the story. And what we see as we come to the end of the passage and in the story is this ironic turn of events for Paul. He went from being housed in the barracks of Jerusalem, caught in the crosshairs of a group of assassins, and then in a dramatic turn of events, he winds up under the protection of a hefty Roman entourage and delivered to the the governor's palace. That, that, That is how the chapter of Paul's life plays out. Now, now, as we read this today, what are we to make of this story? What is the purpose of this passage? In order to understand the point of this passage, it must be read in light of verse 11, which we studied last week. Verse 11 is the punchline. If you recall in that, that verse, Paul, once again, is sitting in the barracks in Jerusalem, when God came and stood by his side in his despair. At that moment, Paul is uncertain of his future, uncertain if he will even make it out of Jerusalem alive. But in that moment, he is told by God to take courage. For as you have testified to the facts about me in Jerusalem, so you must testify also in Rome. God promised Paul that he would eventually share the gospel about the resurrection of Jesus in Rome. And so verse 11 is the backdrop of this passage that we worked through this morning. This this whole story that we just walked through is attached to God's promise in that verse. And, And the story is designed to make God look glorious. Let me explain myself. Luke, who is the author of Acts, intentionally illuminates and heightens the the sense of danger that Paul is in in the story. He he does this several ways in the details, right? He, He mentions the oath that the assassins make, which show how serious they are about killing Paul. He gives a specific number uh, that there were over 40 of them attempting to uh, kill Paul. It really makes Paul out to be the underdog in this passage. It's one versus 40 at this point. It doesn't seem like Paul uh, has a chance. Uh, Even in uncovering the plot, as, as Paul's nephew informs the tribune of this plot, what does the tribune tell the boy in the story? He says, don't tell anybody that you have informed me of these things. Don't tell anybody. Why would he tell that to the nephew? Because the tribune knows that if the nephew spills the beans, then Paul is, even, is in even more danger. And even worse, the nephew himself is in danger. Then the seriousness of the situation is further seen by the tribune's response when he summons this unusually large troop of soldiers to escort one prisoner. Those are the details that Luke specifically shares, if you will, to to raise the stakes. But narratively, there's also a repetition through the passage. This plot against Paul is recalled four different times in the story, and any time anything is repeated in Scripture, it's meant for emphasis. You see, Luke really wants us to feel a bit of anxiety here for Paul. Right? What, what, is, what he's doing in this story, in this passage, is pitting this hopeless bleak circumstance where it doesn't seem like there's any way out and pitting it up against God's promise in verse 11 that Paul will eventually reach Rome and preach the gospel there. 
By design, there's meant to be this, this tension at the beginning of the story with God's promise. Right, as the reader, we look at the first several verses and we say, how on earth will Paul preach in Rome if there are 40 assassins standing by at his doorstep and ready to pounce? These men have the numbers against Paul. They have the assistance of high governing officials and they have a detailed plan. This is airtight. How can the plot fail? Well, unfortunately for them, there's one thing that they did not consider and that their plan was different than God's plan. And if your plan flies in the face of God's plan, your plan will never succeed, no matter how many resources, no matter what the plan, how well you thought out is. And what these assassins will soon find out is that they do not have nearly as much control of the situation as they think. Because just as God is a promise maker, more importantly, he is a promise keeper. No matter how large a threat to his promises, God will always see to it that his promises are fulfilled. And that is what makes God so glorious in this passage is that he is a promise keeper despite the odds. And what's just as remarkable is that God is not just a promise keeper, but how he keeps his promise in this passage. As you read this story, you'll actually notice that God is never mentioned once in this passage. But it's very evident that his fingerprints are all over it. We call this providence. It's providence. Right? The, his invisible hand of providence is at work here. That's how he keeps his promise in this passage, through providence. What is providence? This definition, I don't know where I got it from, um, but I think it's pretty good. I wrote it down at one point. Uh, providence says that God is actively and personally at work in all things to govern, preserve, and direct so that ultimately his will may be accomplished and he may be glorified. Essentially, providence describes God's ongoing relationship with his creation. And it, it describes what God does in creation to accomplish his own purposes. And more times than not, God's providence plays out through ordinary means rather than supernatural means. That's what we see in this story, right? God accomplishes his purposes through ordinary human agents, ordinary people making ordinary decisions. Despite this, however, behind the curtain of God's providence, we could claim that there is a supernatural imprint on this. Because even in the orchestration of the ordinary, there is this supernatural peace as God is bringing all of these different people and all of these different daily decisions to, together to accomplish exactly what he promised to Paul. Right, right? There's a supernatural peace and that there are so many elements in this story that are unexpected to the reader. If, if you were to write this story, this is not how you would write it out. Right? Consider the people that God uses to accomplish his purposes behind the scene. We have Paul's nephew, who's a, who's a young boy and not even important enough for his name to be recorded. He's never mentioned anywhere else in the Bible, right? right? We have this self-interested tribune, Claudius Lysias, who cares more about himself and how he looks in the eyes of the governor than for Paul and Paul's ministry or how he looks in the eyes of God. And then finally, we have the Roman army itself that protects Paul. The Roman army, an institution that was responsible for the crucifixion of Jesus. They were the ones who killed Jesus. The original reader considered Rome as the enemy. And here they are escorting Paul and protecting him from danger. This is just uncanny and completely unexpected. Once again, if I were in God's position, th th those are not the players that I would use. And all of this plays out by pure happenstance, while Paul is completely helpless and powerless to influence the situation himself. 
There's only one part of the story where Paul does anything, and it's when he instructs the centurion to take his nephew to the tribune. And even in that, the centurion doesn't have to listen to Paul. Paul is helpless. Paul is hopeless. Yet God is in control of the entire situation from beginning to end without missing a single step. Somehow, some way, even through the most bleak situations and unexpected circumstances, God will see his promises through because he is a promise keeper. It's in his nature. And this is why a story like this is so important, especially when placed immediately following one of his promises, the promise that he made to Paul in verse 11. Because it's easy enough to make a promise. There's not a single person in this room that can't make a promise. Anybody can make a promise. But the strength of a promise only resides in one's ability to follow through. If you can't follow through from the outset on your promise, then your promise is worth nothing. Your promise holds no power if you cannot and you do not have the ability to see it through. It's worthless. God shows us here that he follows through and that he has the ability and the strength and the power and the wisdom to orchestrate all things to follow through even when it appears that the odds are stacked against him. The strength of a promise only resides in one's ability to follow through. And the hope of a promise, the hope that I have in somebody making a promise only resides in the track record of the one making the promises, right? Because if I make a promise, the more promises that I break, the less reliable my promise is, the less weight that it holds, the less chance that you are going to believe me the next time I make a promise. But the more I keep my promises, the more likely you are to believe me when I make a promise in the future. This story is just one example within thousand instances in scripture where God is a promise maker and a promise keeper. The the pages of God's word overflow with story after story about God coming through on his promises. And so while God may not deliver us from specific hardships or circumstances in our life because he never promised individual delivery from specific instances, Well, he may not do that when he makes a promise in scripture, in his word, we can take that to the bank. Promises, like if God is for us, who can stand against us? Who can be against us? Promises uh, uh, about how in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Or how about the promise that God will meet all of your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus? What about the promise that Jesus made when he said, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, I will give you rest. There's the promise that there is nothing, that nothing is able to separate us from the love of God. Or that if we confess our sins, that he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness? Or how about the promise that there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus? Or how about the promise that those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God? Or how about when Jesus promised that he's going to prepare a place for us, but he's going to come back to get his own? so that we may be with him? Or how about the promise that all will be resurrected from the dead? All will be resurrected from the dead. But for those who have turned to Christ, they will be resurrected to eternal life. And those who stand against Christ will be resurrected to eternal punishment. See, not all of God's promises are warm and fuzzy, but all of God's promises will be fulfilled. 
even a hard promise that God is not afraid to follow through on. The story of the Bible is one giant promise that God is committed to his people, committed to his plans and committed to his glory. And there has yet to be a single promise that he has not followed through on. So as we live out our days of powerless uncertainty, let us cling to God's promises knowing that he is able and he is faithful. Would you pray with me? And Lord, we um, just marvel at your glory, that you are mindful of us even, that you care to reveal yourself and make yourself known. And we thank you, Lord, that we can trust you, that you are faithful. Even now, as we come into a time of communion, Father, we recognize that we are remembering a promise that you gave us. And we are declaring another promise that is to be fulfilled at a later time. For this, we give you praise. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.